Hi, everyone, and welcome to our panel. My name is Amy Peck. I'm the founder and CEO of Endeavor VR. And we are talking today about the impact of XR on human lives, but I think we're going to cover a lot of uh, broader topics today. We are, at the moment, missing a couple of panelists, but I'm very happy, and I've been chatting backstage with Martin Attell, who is here, who is the CEO of VoteBash. So welcome, Martin. Thank you. It's great to be oh, here. I, oh, there you are. Now we can hear you. Good. Yeah, uh, thank so, you. so I think we're, you and, it's going to be you and I for the moment. Hopefully uh, our other panelists will join. And any of you who are listening, feel free to drop some comments in the chat, but we'll just make this very uh, free form. And so let's kind of start with the over. Well, actually, let's start with you. So we were just talking about your, your company. Tell us a little bit more about VoteBash. Yes, so VoteBash is a social voting platform, consumer-centric uh, voting platform where we help brands and organizations uh, get a real-time feedback from their customer base where the customers that they don't know. And we do that by incentivizing the voters with deals and discounts from those brands that they are craving. And when we do that, uh, we turn voters into brand ambassadors and they share it with the friends and family. Thus resulting in a bigger range and a bigger um, audience base and sample size of the market research. Um, in turn, the voter gets nice deals and discounts, so everybody wins. And, you know, in the background, the um, retailers or the brands, they will get tangible, actionable feedback in real time. So that's what we do. And we're actually doing now an overhaul from our platform and uh, once that is ready to go uh, it's going to be even more exciting with new features and new engagement um, benefits that we are going to bring to the roster now having said that um, now we see the pandemic it was even more important to to reach out to your customers that are locked at home uh, we see that the trend is even more increasing that people are engaging with their brands uh, from home, and it's even more so important to understand the different behaviors that have manifested after this pandemic. So I think the consumer before the pandemic and the consumer after the pandemic are completely different type of consumers. And now um, we are deploying new technologies to close the gap, as you will, between brands and consumer base. With XR, it's going to even be more exciting, we believe. And that's why we have began to deploy a program and working on this, um, which we call uh, Vopesh Vision, where we believe that we can bring um, XR capabilities to the voting process so that you can create an opinion layer on the internet. And when you go somewhere, let's a, uh, in the supermarket or in a retailer uh, or at the dealership or wherever you go and you hover over a product or you see something that you want to buy, you see also the opinions about these products or what people have been voting. So I think that's very interesting and that's going to enhance the experience with XR. On another level, we have been gone working um, towards this project because we see in 2021 alone, uh, XR has been um, about $31 billion. And in less than five years, it's going to go to $297 billion. And that's just like four years, right? It's almost 10x um, this amount. So that's going to be really interesting to see what else is going to be there and what else is going to be delivered on the market. The strong appetite for um, XR capabilities in order to close the gap between Excellent. consumers and brands. Um, and then we also see a way for consumers to, to do things from afar that they are not able to do now, like um, travel experiences, concert experiences, and those are engagement too. So we do believe that with XR capabilities, we can enable and enrich the uh, 
we call it the LFH, the live from home experience, um, rather than working from home, live from home experience. And even if the next pandemic would come up, we would be prepared with um, better experiences so that people can still emerge in engaging activities that are enriching and not tiresome. So those are the type of things that we are excited about. Excellent. Excellent. And, and another panelist came. <laughs> oh, yeah. Sorry for being light. For oh. minute no, no worries. We just got started. So please uh, introduce yourself. Uh, I'm Karim Kosir. I'm CEO of Mental Lycan. Uh, Mental Lycan is a software company uh, focused on artificial intelligence and financial systems. So what we focus on right now is building intelligent and distributed economic models. Mm-hmm. And are, are you looking at um, immersive technology and, and seeing some trends in, in that direction? I, I, certainly on the capital market side, we've just started seeing more interest uh, now that, um, you know, Apple and Facebook are, are, you know, reportedly coming out with headsets. So it's it, it, not that the industry will move capital markets yet um, in terms of stock price, but I, I think it's something now that everybody is on, you know, it's on everybody's radar now. I'm curious what you're seeing relative to the financial markets. Well, when it comes to financial markets, uh, let's let's please thank you for the fabulous question. It's a, it's a seeing a very simple question, very straightforward. But uh, let's think about uh, mobile phones. And whenever they came, it was what a toy is that? I want to sit in my office. And now I think about XR like uh, the same way, but just uh, much more immersively. So it's it's just uh, viral. It's uh, contagious and it's uh, something that uh, deflects us from reality as much as it helps us cope with it. So it has multiple uses, good and bad. And if anything is uh, related to gaming, which is actually the case here, it will be something uh, that has pretty good financial bearings. Uh, So when it comes to the gaming sector, when it comes to um, direct uh, human uh, brain interf- um, brain machine interfaces. Uh, when it comes to bioengineering, when it comes to uh, dating, when it comes to not only dating but all activities that social activities and so on. Uh, and the 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 very interesting thing about XR and in specific augmented reality is that um, uh, argu- it affects how we how we uh, behave in real life not only uh, uh, in, in, in a virtual or uh, augmented environment, but in real life. So this has uh, some very good potential for economic growth in multiple fields. I just cannot list them because you can, you can just go about anything and have something to do with it. Some are good, some are bad. Yeah, it's funny. I, I, I do a lot of talks on, on the subject and I have one slide that has basically, you know, an image representing every single vertical. And it, it, it's just to indicate that that really, you know, we're thinking about, you know, AR and VR. And you mentioned gaming. That, that seems to be everybody's initial, uh, you know, idea about, you know, what the, what the utility is. But, you know, is going to be an important component of everything we do and drawing the parallel to mobile I think is 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 valuable in that it's going to kind of take that same trajectory we're sort of in that curiosity phase you know what does this do how can I use it and then you know we, we're moving to where the the world is our screen so we're moving from 2d to 3d um, so I'd, I'd love to hear, you know, uh, maybe we'll start with you, Martin, just in, in terms, I, you know, you're looking very closely at the consumer. Does the consumer care yet about, you know, AR and VR? Uh, you see a strong uh, increase in, in, in consumer behavior going in that direction and certainly triggers like uh, COVID-19 um, where people are actually locked at home is definitely going to... Uh, boost more of that need. Um, but in the sense, we are not doing XR just for the sake of XR. I think um, when you can implement it in a meaningful way where it's going to enrich a certain experience or where it's going to enhance uh, a certain activity that will be more efficient, 
then I think we'll be more on board with this. Um, so our take is uh, to use XR capabilities to, to educate the user, to educate uh, the user about certain products or about certain services or certain areas with uh, AI technology. And on top of that, capabilities that will allow um, the, the user to, to see the opinions in real time as an opinion layer um, in, in real time, right? So, and then on the other end with B2Bs, um, we just think that that will also be very interesting to do data collection and data mining and finding new ways to display data. And, and that is very exciting. And I think that's also um, what I just heard from the financial perspective, something that will be manifesting tremendously. Um, so yeah, the, the, the implementations could be endless. Um, it's just about uh, making sure that, that the implementations are meaningful for the consumers. And then I believe they will also um, be um, adapted very quickly. Yeah, and, and Harjit, so, I, I still, I still really like the financial perspective because I think it's, uh, you know, we we want to kind of grow up as an in industry. We're still a very nascent industry, and and you know what what are going to be the real markers that you see? I mean, if, if especially if we if we draw a line, you know, between XR adoption and the you know mobile adoption and how we went from simply them being mobile phones to really these you know smart devices and computing devices. Mm -hmm. You know, where on that curve do you think we are now and what, what do we need to get to, to where, you know, we really sit up and pay attention? Yeah, uh, the most, uh, the most penetrative things in life just do not manifest themselves as I'm here. They are just there and you can, cannot just pinpoint them. So uh, try to list 10 uses out of hand of your mobile phone or your computer or uh, on, on your kitchen. It's just there, the utility there. So it's not about goggles, not about glasses only, and uh, things like that. But when it comes to our use of our dimensional reality, for example, it's like how to engage a farmer in the faraway land in Africa with their, uh, with their partners in a meaning, meaningful way. It can be face-to-face -face, uh, or, uh, of course, uh, virtual reality stuff, or it could be uh, retail, or it could be uh, negotiation uh, media. So, uh, and they don't have to use uh, glasses, specific glasses for that. It's, it's just how, you, how information is manifested, how it's collected, how it's uh, put uh, into the uh, uh, control loop and feedback and stuff. So... When, when, when things become like that's the reality, then the industry has grown. So, for example, and, and this is a very, a very real uh, case, somebody uh, whose legs were amputated. That's a very direct uh, use of argumented reality because now they can imagine themselves wrong. And it helps them psychologically. It helps them uh, be, uh, uh, have a better life and cling to life, uh, especially in old age. That's the one good thing. The other good thing is it's a, an addictive technology. So there are positives and negatives. Like um, we have, you know, some people, Warren Buffett, for example, uh, he says that uh, iPhone is underpriced because it, it replaced the need to take a, a jet. Okay, that's good because that's the utility for him. But for most of us, just uh, going through Facebook endlessly, the utility is not that great. But still, we're addicted to it. I think he's not. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, 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 I'm not sure I explain myself correctly or uh, in, a, in, a, in a meaningful way. But what I'm trying to say, it will just go slowly, slowly, slowly until it's there and we cannot get, just get rid of it. Yeah, I think you're right. I think I, I think I refer to the the tipping point is when you know it has utility, as you mentioned, context. You know, where where am I? What 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 do I want to do? And and fun, right? It has to actually be fun, and and not in a gaming way, but it has to have a, an interface that is intuitive and simple and sort of enjoyable to use. Right now. 
I have these, you know, I have, I have every one of the devices around my house. I've got my magic leap is right here. Um, and you know, it's sort of a palaver sometimes to put the, you know, get it, put it on, get it set up, you know, when in, in, with, with PC VR where you're tethered, you have to have a, you know, a, a VR enabled laptop, you know, it takes 15, 20 minutes to get it set up. Now with things like the Quest 2 with some of the smart glasses and the wearables that are going to come out, that's taking, taking away a lot of that friction that, you know, and that's, and that, that will, I think, you know, really start to, to push not only the consumers, right? Because we see how snap in these filters and to your point, it's like, yeah, you know, is it, is it really useful for us to just be taking endless selfies with, you know, you know, little bunny ears? No, probably not. But, um, but think, of, think of how, you know, instead of looking at down at your phone, you could have that data projected in your field of view. Um, I would like it at a conference, right? We, you know, I meet a thousand people at a conference. And then if I see them again, I never remember. And it's not because I'm a terrible person. I just don't, you know, I'm out of RAM. But then I'd be able to recognize who they are. Their LinkedIn profile might come up. When we really get further down the road, even a note of our last interaction would come up. And so it's sort of bringing that sort of human connection together, which is really how we should be thinking about technology. So you're, you're, I can see you. Yeah. <laughs> I, yeah, okay. you I have two comments because that's very interesting. Uh, that's very interesting because actually uh, I, I had something to do with the first and uh, now uh, there was some discussion I had on the second point. So the first one I was still a student, that was far, far, <laughs> so many years ago. And um, we had a project of, um, of an implement, implant. It, we didn't need uh, glasses, we didn't need anything, just it's an implant. We had it for uh, f five months at a time, and it was, uh, I think it was in the UK. And uh, just okay, we controlled everything around, we played uh, with it, and so it's just under the, in your skin. I, I think this is the future. It's, I mean, this is why I mentioned uh, uh, machine uh, brain interfaces. And this has its uh, dangerous sides, really dangerous sides. Uh, but I, I believe that glasses will eventually evolve into something that we just an implant, implant and nothing more than that. Uh, and that will be quick, I believe. Uh, just, you, you see, when we talk of technologies, people get wary about them a little bit. Then they just embrace them, love them, and just, uh, it's, 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 it's a common scene now to have, uh, you know, six months old holding a mobile device right now. So just paying it once, just uh, parents are. Uh, so, okay. Uh, penetration would come in many formats. Um, things like computer was like that, then it became like that. Uh, the natural course. The, the result is what, is what matters to me most, actually. And that uh, brings us to the second point, which is you talked about a conference and uh, pilots. They use, uh, you know, they use quite uh, complicated systems uh, when it comes to uh, operating an aircraft. But you know what? Uh, they they focus on the central field of view, not peripheral field of view. And and there's a reason for that, because when when, when the peripheral uh, the peripheral view, uh, our brains use that to uh, calculate speed, relative position, uh, so you do not do not collide with people on street and stuff. So, uh, when it comes to uh, glasses, four to ten percent, uh, maybe uh, this pre uh, preliminary study, would be very irritated by it, and they will never use it again. Twenty-five will have uh, quite uh, twenty-five percent have uh, uh, quite a tough time. Then they will be just accustomed to it. What you describe now would require quite a bit of training, <laughs> and that's a problematic. <laughs> So, uh, uh, how we make it as passive as possible? We're not there yet. Oh no, no, we have a we have a long way to go. And actually, even being able to use uh, and and this is really more in the mixed reality realm than just augmented reality. Um, but I'm talking more about just uh, effectively what you talked about, sort of a, a heads up display. So you get a small piece of data. It's voice activated. 
and you you are using some of the technology that exists today, what's really important is, and, and Martin, you actually touched on this a little bit, it's really important that data is filtered and what we want to see, and that's why that context piece is so important because what's going to happen is on any given wall or area, there's going to be hundreds of thousands of, of digital overlays. And so we have to have a mechanism to be able to filter what we want to see. And we need to be able to use a very intuitive interface, eventually a brain interface, but it'll be voice and gesture and gaze. And it'll be a small piece of information that pops up for a short period of time because we don't, as we saw with Pokemon Go, people were walking into lampposts because they were doing this. Um, but it's it, part of it is a... Uh, you know, it's it's a huge kind of, you know, user experiment. We need to understand how the user can best leverage the data. How do they want to see their data? Do they want to use their voice and say, oh, can you send a text to so-and-so and it'll just pop up, you'll check it, and then you'll say send, and then it goes away? Or do you want to have, you know, directions, for example, if you're lost in Manhattan or, you know, London, you know, and it'll give you directions where to go. Um, how, how do we want to use it? And consumers are going to be the big driver of that. And then they will define how we leverage the technology in a, a commercial environment. So Martin, I, I hope you're not frozen, but I'd love to hear your thoughts. Things that you will see. Okay. I hope you're breaking up a little bit. Martin, we may need you to uh -oh, hop out uh, and back in because you're really breaking up. Yes. Yeah, we, breaking we, can't, up? we can't hear you. Yeah. Do you mind just you re maybe now? refreshing? And let me see. Uh, it's, hopefully it's a little better. Yeah. Can you can you hear me now and see me? Now, now, okay. now, now you're okay. Okay, perfect. So a, a couple things that I think will happen um, is that people will get a better ability to try out things. So I come from an automotive background, and, and one of the things I see real in the future is that people can try out cars without. Oh, we've lost you again. Oh dear. Mm. All right, Harjit, it's up to you now for a bit. It's uh, I'm Karim. <laughs> Did I say? Oh, I'm so sorry. Uh, it's okay. Uh, um, what was the question? <laughs> well, it was funny. I I actually and I and I had that, and then I looked on our list of, of people, and it said so. Um, my apologies. Um, right. Yeah. So so it was just it was it was kind of a, around you know how consumers will sort of drive the way that we interact wearables as they hit the market, um, and then that will inform the utility within a commercial or an enterprise environment? Well, this is where I become wary of argumentative reality in specific. Uh, as you said, and it's, it's very well placed actually, the problem with information that it is filtered or it flows directly or freely, it, it flows. It flows in some direct ways, in direct ways, some filters are there, but some filters are not. If we think of search engines, for example, they, they are very vital information filters in, in, in many ways. And when we, we talk about social networks, they, they, they can institute the filters or they can be uh, some echo chambers or they can be on discussion platforms. And this is not uh, uh, in the direct, under the direct control of each and every consumer of information is actually, it happens to be more uh, controlled by the companies offering the service. And augmented reality will be offered by companies as well. And this is, it, it gives people freedom to use information, huge information, but it's like when you have so much, when, when you become overwhelmed, you ask for help. 
And at that point, you accept whatever comes whenever you have some utility of information coming your way. So uh, this point, which relates to Martin's point, is data will be collected in different ways. So th this has to be managed in some good, some good framework of thought. So for users to use the information in a better way, we can use, for example, any of those uh, voice assistant uh, uh, applications now in better ways. You can call, you can do stuff, and uh, you can write a message. You can it, So the usability is great, is improved, and it will be much improved with augmented reality, of course. So it will open up uh, ways of new cluster of applications and services. How people will use it, it's another thing. Yeah, I think so. And I, it's, I see someone who's a, um, a health consultant who's who's joined us. And, you know, you, you mentioned healthcare when we first started talking. I think that, you know, going back to, uh, you know, you mentioned sort of this aspirational version of oneself. Um, behavioral health, I think, is another uh, really, really, Im you know, important vertical for this technology. Um, there have been some incredible studies around, uh, you know, ki children who are on the spectrum who have Asperger's, who have a very diff difficult time connecting with children socially and on an emotional level. And what they found uh, were actually kind of two really interesting takeaways. One was that when they were in a virtual environment, even though they knew that the person they were speaking with was an avatar and a digital representative, they normally have a hard time looking people in real life in the eye. But in that environment, they were, they were able to overcome their fears because there was sort of that level of understanding that, you know, this is, I'm talking to a person, but they, they have sort of a layer of veneer over them. So that helped delay their fears on that side. And then the second and, and, and probably more notable piece was that they were able to practice social behaviors that would help them be successful. Children are, you know, very, very difficult. And they're sometimes purposefully mean and they're sometimes unwittingly mean. I don't uh, but know. Those, <laughs> no, but I mean those. But those those scars when you're a child, um, you know, they last, you know, forever. They 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 follow you, and so to be able to set them up for success, and then you think about any challenges that people have in their real lives. There are challenges with anxiety. There are challenges with addiction. Um, so these are some of the. I, I think you know when we're talking about how XR can really improve life. I think some, these are just a few of the examples. And and Martin, we're, we're, I'm glad you're back. Uh, so I do want to circle back to, you know, thinking about this this layer of data, this digital da data that's going to live all around us, and you know what's what's the importance of it, and how will we actually navigate it? That's for Martin. Yes. Yeah, I think the importance is that we create uh, a layer that is actually helping uh, the consumer. So what I was trying to tell before was that if I want to go into a dealership and I want to try out a new car, I want to see all the functions, I want to see all the explanations, and I can do it from my living room. Uh, while I'm ha having my headset or when I want to do real estate and I want to visit a home that I want to buy, I don't have to travel far and I can go into that home and I can see all the capabilities of that home and the appliances and everything and get all the information while I'm actually trying out the layout of the home. I think that's going to be very interesting. So um, what is going to matter is that you implement these features not for the sake of it, but for making things easier in a meaningful way so that we can do things better than we were able to do before. And I always come back to the example uh, of Google Maps. Like, uh, I remember the times that they, uh, I'm driving a car with real life paper map. Um, most of the people that and, and when you have uh, now Google Maps and, and all, the, all these navigations that are just online, that is enrichment and makes it far more easier to plan your, your travel. 
And I think that impact is going to be exactly the same as what XR is going to have on retail and on any kind of transaction that you're going to see in the future, whether it is a real estate transaction, whether it is a purchase at a point of sale, or whether it is um, um, doing financial transactions or even handling uh, data. But it will be done in such a way that, as you said, it's going to be fun, it's going to be interesting, and it's going to be very engaging. That, I believe, uh, definitely will happen. Um, and on another note, uh, I do believe that to a strong application in manufacturing where people will be doing certain jobs from home uh, while they are having their headset and they do maybe a session of a couple of hours doing manufacturing job and then maybe the other shift can take over by setting up a headset and they start working on uh, the production line uh, or even in construction. Um, so it's going to be then less dangerous for people to work in manufacturing and construction when they are doing these kind of things. Um, so that's something that I think I'm very excited about. There's not just the consumer part of it, but also the manufacturing part of it um, and the B2B part of it will definitely will be re revolutionized by these implementations. Then you mentioned in the retail environment, I think there, you know, I think one thing is just being able to look at a, a particular product and then get all of the information. We're also very concerned with, you know, sourcing and sustainability. You know, you could easily just have an overlay that tells you, you know, what, where are the, where are the fabrics or how was this made? Where was this made? Um, so I think that that, that layer of, of detail and then within, you know, factories and maintenance, we're seeing huge improvements in safety and in training by having these digital overlays. You know, Kareem, you mentioned being able to kind of understand an environment. You could actually have a remote assistant. You could have an expert remotely using the outward facing cameras on the device can see exactly what you see and they can help you through a particular task uh, rather than flying somebody out to either fix a piece of machinery or, do some training or whatever it happens to be. And then there's collaboration, which has really been fast tracked. You know, we're all, we're all zoomed out, <laughs> I think at this point. And so, you know, my, you know, my team, you know, we're scattered all over the world and, and, you know, we, we meet in both virtual and mixed reality. So I have a, I have a magic leap here and they have an application called jump. And, you know, we all hop in with our devices and we, we meet, we whiteboard and it's, it's really effective. And I can actually walk with mixed reality. I can walk around my house without bumping into anything. With VR, you know, I have to map out my, my 10 by 10 space so I don't, you know, walk into the coffee table. <laughs> but this, yeah, that's very these are, the, these are the user, you know, the user questions we need to answer. So, so on the utility side, back to the utility and the user experience, you know, how do you how do you see us solving some of the some of the kind of clunky, you know, aspects of it today? Martin, do you want to take a shot at that? Yeah. So I think the most important part from the user experience is to make it simple and to make it fun. Um, I think um, when I take an example, I walk into a supermarket. I don't know which aisle I can find something. Right? That's everyone had that problem before. If you have an application that makes it very simple and easy to navigate this, at, that tells you, hey, you can find that peanut butter in that aisle or you can find uh, that type of product in that aisle, um, then it's very easy um, and it makes, makes a lot of sense. Um, if it's very complicated to use, then of course that brings another variable to the equation of me experiencing. Um, this this reality and then it might not help but it should basically help as as a navigational procedure or when i'm using it in an education experience where i'm learning a new skill like becoming a pilot or learning a new skill of in terms of doing sports or whatever it is uh, it needs to be very easy uh, and the guidance needs to be very straightforward and easy and that's where i believe where gamification comes in because they just were the first ones to actually um, really 
break that cycle and solve that problem. So when you are trying a new game or where you are trying a new simulation, they make it very easy to, to understand it and how the ins and outs of everything works. And I think that's where um, the reality of things needs to go. We all need to understand um, how gamification works and we all need to understand how the UX in gamification is done so effectively so that we can transform these digital transformations into it, into retail, into education, into wellness, into sport, uh, into manufacturing and other type of solutions that um, will be deployed uh, 10 years from now uh, or even sooner, I believe. And I think that's, that's the exciting part to finding it out. I think with the headsets, you have the technology there and uh, they will become better and better, like the, the, the phones became better. But what is it in terms of what you're going to do in UX and UI? That's the yeah. question. Yeah, I think, and, and the human experience, right? And so, Kareem, you know, when we're thinking about, you know, I, I guess the overarching theme of this discussion is, you know, how do we make our lives better? Not just using technology for technology's sake. There's so much technology out there. Uh, you know, it's all, kind of, you know, evolving at an incredibly rapid pace. And so how do we just take a, a minute and, and think, you know, how is this going to enhance the human experience as opposed to just being another gadget in our lives? Well, actually, um, that's a very nice question, a uh, very deep one, too. So I have three points to lay out uh, shortly. <laughs> uh, the first thing is uh, the thing about fun. Fun is good, but it's not always the best thing to do. So I'm not... I'm, I'm not very concerned, for example, uh, no disrespect intended to anybody, but uh, when I go to supermarket, I think, okay, I journey a supermarket, so I want to have this experience. <laughs> so that's the human way of doing it. So I don't want somebody to take it from me by just going to give me an application. I look at my computer all the time. So that's one thing. Uh, and whenever... You know, whenever we just sit on, on the couch and never move, we become less healthier. It's the same metaphor, uh, psychologically, uh, physically, economically as well. Uh, so that's the first point. And the second point is, um, well, it, it, it's a technology that has very deep ramifications. Do we live a real life? Do we augment our life? Or do we replace our life with a virtual reality. So, for example, if we take safety when it comes to work, it's much more safer, much safer, just to give a, a robot uh, a, will, uh, a, a driver's job. And, and this is actually true. So one thing we worked on was, okay, let's uh, replace underwater welding with robots. It was done. It cost... Uh, fabulous amount of money an hour to give this person uh, every, because they risk the, their lives every minute. So it's much safer to give it to a robot, but it's very difficult technically. Anyway, uh, could you augment that? Yes. Could you replace that? Yes. Some, some, some jobs could be augmented, but many jobs would be replaced by uh, an automated. And that brings us to the third and last point. What concerns me quite, uh, quite uh, seriously with uh, XR is now we have more free time. And as uh, our economies succeed and go forward, we have more free time. So uh, 20, 30 years ago, people worked for 16, uh, 16 hours a day. Now we talk about eight. We're in luxury. And now some people talk of four. So, wow. So we have lots of time on our hand. But the amount of work that we have is less. Now, if I give you a piece of software and a nice piece of equipment just to have fun, well, okay, I think somebody's going to stay home forever. <laughs> and that's one thing. The other thing is, oh, with, with that fashion intelligence, with automation, we don't really have to put so much work, so how would we get money if we don't work? So would XR be uh, a way of making 
could we make XR a way of generating income and distributed equal income? Or could we make a more, add more, one more barrier to the labor market? And so I that, think, that's a great yeah. question. Yeah, no, and I think, I think you're right. I think, you know, the, it, that that concern about automation, and especially Martin and I were talking about this before we went live, that you know, if if you can replace an activity with a robot, it's it's generally a, a rote activity, right? And and so we are we are creative beings, right? We may not express that creativity, you know, in a in a very overt way, but ultimately we have the ability to create something from nothing. You know, and that and, and can be in any form. And I think we're going to see a, a parallel economy come out. We've already seen these behaviors in the digital landscape. Digital goods now actually have value. We've seen, you know, cryptocurrency and, and mining, though it's not great for the environment at all, um, will solve some of those problems of, of processing power. But we're seeing an emerging economy and it's not just around XR, it's around these virtual environments and it's around cryptocurrency uh, and, and then data, which Martin brought up earlier, you know, our data, if we're willing to take, make the effort to take back control of our data, someone will build the inner interface. We can actually seamlessly monetize data that, the Googles and the Facebooks of this world are doing today. And we can have direct, and this is, I think, your your next business unit, Martin, we can have direct relationships with brands where we are willing to share certain pieces of data that they can requisition, and they're willing to give us microtransactions um, around that particular data. And the minute they stop giving us something that's relevant or interesting to us, we can turn off the faucet. Absolutely, and and that's that's really where it's going. And I haven't even touched on the topic of cashless society. So when you see the cashless society, how it is unfolding in the Asian Pacific region, and now uh, with the XR capabilities that we have, I think transactions are going to be seamless and very enriched uh, in a way that we have not seen before. Um, and and that when these two worlds come together. I do believe that we can enhance certain uh, things of our society and we can enhance certain ways of doing in our society. I absolutely agree with Kareem that, uh, yeah, it can potentially be dangerous that we are ending up with a world where, where people are uh, doing a lot uh, at home. And I think um, that is also one of the evolutions that this will bring forward. Uh, where social media and, and digital transformation created a consumer-centric um, reality. And I think with, with XR technologies, the way they are going to be implemented, um, we might even create a home-centric uh, reality that is just basically uh, manifesting from, from my home address or from someone else's home address. And that can quite be a, a, a big market to, to capture. Um, whether you are for it or not, but I think that will definitely manifest um, by itself. Uh, Kareem, I can tell that you are a little suspicious about this yeah. brave new world. <laughs> yeah, because uh, when the world is based on consumption, everybody wants monetization and just head the wall with everything. Let's just face it. So, you know, um, life is very nice until... We just have to pay for what we do. Uh, it's always like that. And, and the thing is, it, it, it doesn't matter what size of a company there is. It matters that their income at the end of the day come from quite limited uh, guy or gal with some limited income. So if if xr is coming to uh, will become a new way of just uh having more concentrated uh, consumption patterns which are not sustainable in the first place because when i need to consume something i need to afford to to to, to buy it so to put that technology to do a seamless uh uh transaction that's good 
uh, but I need to generate income by the same virtue to pay for that. So I think the, the, the for the greatest, not the greatest good, but the greatest good of all of this system not crumbling, this technology should be leveraged for, yes, for whatever economic behavior that there is, and to found new ways for people to generate income. So, and that's actually mm, what we what we're focused on, and that's why I said intelligent and distributed uh, economic models, because we need to we need to democratize how things are done, how economic and socioeconomic activities are carried out. XR is a great virtue for that, great opportunity for that, but it's also a great opportunity to just keep people on the wheel. So it has. 